Good morning, good morning. I'm glad to be here. I'm sure you guys are all glad to be here. I, uh, I recognize that you guys probably aren't ready to sit down because I'm not ready to stand up here. But, you know, the clock says it's time. I hope that you guys enjoyed the blizzard as much as I did. It was my favorite kind of blizzard. I think I saw snow for like two minutes at my window and then it went back to rain. We actually, we had a really strange day yesterday. I was outside in the morning taking care of my goat chores and I had the herd was out and uh, I, they had food and everything. I, I throw hay for them in the morning, and they kind of were just running around. Like, they usually just stop and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. But they were kind of running around all over the place, and they had one up in my front yard that was just yelling and yelling and yelling and yelling. And I just glanced over one last time to see, like, why in the world is this goat still yelling and then I realized, oh, she's having babies. So that's why. Yeah, she was kidding. I, I, that was not intended as a joke. Desiree just reminded me, like, that's the actual technical term for a goat having babies is they're kidding. And she was kidding. And the, actually, the funny thing is, is that in the barn... In the morning when I let out the main herd, there was two other babies. And I still have no idea whose mom, who, whose they are. I, don't, I have no idea who they belong to. Nobody seems to claim them, but they're, they're okay. So it's odd. Yeah, somebody's feeding them. <laughs> Actually, it's me sometimes. We've been bottle feeding a lot of goat babies this season. So it's, it's kind of fun too. Anyway... That was uh, our day yesterday, and I was praying against the snow. My kids are pretty angry with me about that, I think, because they wanted snow. But I'm glad that we're here. We were prepared, if, if we did get snow down here, to just do this uh, live stream from, like, my house or something. But I'm glad we're not doing that also. So I'm glad you're all here. I'm glad to be here. Let's go over some announcements now that uh, I've rambled long enough. Uh, the women's prayer meeting, you guys know about that. You guys know about the um, emergency prayer chain. If you don't know about those things, just call Karen Kinney. She'll <laughs> fill you in about that. Uh, the women's Bible study Wednesday mornings. Where is that? Is that? I don't see that on the, at your house still? Yeah, so call Karen. 9.30. Um, you guys have books in the back. It says books are $8, I guess. Uh, and then the women's conference is coming up. And um, I asked Lori if she needed to talk about this. But she said you guys have covered it thoroughly the last couple of weeks about if you need a place to stay, what you're planning to do. There's sign-up sheets in the back. And that's coming up um, at the end of April. The Wednesday night Bible study, that's still with me. Um, we have one study left in the book of Acts, and I'm looking forward to that. This coming Wednesday night, that's at 5 p.m., we're going to finish up the book of Acts, and then uh, I'll tell you what we're going to do after that on Wednesday night. So if you want to know where we're going next, you have to tune in. Or, you know, watch it later whenever. I don't, I don't think there's a whole lot of people that actually watch me live at 5 o'clock. I know some people do, but um, there's not really any, like, great benefit you get of seeing me live rather than seeing it, you know, the next day or anything. There's not a lot of any personal interaction <laughs> that takes place. So watch it later on. Watch it on YouTube. Um, we have some cool... Um, prayer, praise reports. That's what I'm looking for. Um, it says here that uh, Cassie Triplett is a match for Jen. 
And so they're going to go through with that, like, liver donor. She can give, like, a portion of her liver, and that's going to happen on March 27th. That's coming up soon. Um, and then we were praying for um, Don's friend, Ty, Ty Castro. And I guess he got in a motorcycle accident, and they he was in ICU for a while. And I think they said that he's going to be getting out of ICU I'm looking around for Don. There he is on Monday, and he's able to get up and kind of move around and stuff like that. So that's a huge praise report. Um, looking forward, uh, we're still praying for Israel. Uh, we're praying for Debbie Byler, um, who will know by March 12th if she will have hernia repair and possible gallbladder removal. So that's something to be praying for moving forward. So with that and of course we always pray for our folks in the armed forces people that we know and love um i've been seeing a lot of brandon bardo lately and he's looking at hopefully moving into something different in his own personal world of the armed forces so praying for god's will with that and um of course our local law enforcement and first responders and things like that is that what? Oh, oh, men's Bible. Uh, I didn't announce it because I didn't see it on my sheet. Yeah, I'm sorry. Men's Bible studies Fridays. Have you guys still been moving around or is it your house now? Okay, so Fridays at nine, right? Right. All right. Let's pray. Thanks for reminding me. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity for us to get together and uh, we have this safe building. It's warm. It's dry. Lord, you kept us safe from the storm. Lord, I pray that you would um, continue to keep our, your hand of protection over us, Lord. And we're just so grateful that we can walk into your presence this morning, uh, worship you, give our praises to you. Lord, we thank you for those people that we've been praying for and we've seen you work in their lives. Lord, we thank you for uh, Cassie and Jen, that they're a match and that um, they can move forward with that liver donation. Lord, I pray that you would have your hand of, of uh, healing on both those women, Lord, that you would take good care of them. And also um, Ty Castro, as he is still healing, Lord, we pray that you would help him to cling to you, that he would know that your hand is upon him and that he would have uh, rapid recovery and then be able to move forward with the things he's got to do in life. And Lord, um, this morning, as we enter into your presence, Lord, we, we just lift up these praises to you and ask that you would uh, be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand.
Yeah. 
Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, yes, Lord, when maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is A thousand hallelujahs. 
you made the way for us to enter into your throne room and worship you. Lord, we pray that you would continue to be uh, just the center of our hearts and minds as we open up your word. Lord, I pray that you would help us to continue to, to have those hearts of worship and, and adoration as we learn from your word. And bless uh, children's ministry as well. Lord, I pray that uh, our, our kids would draw closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, kids, get out of here. They're mostly mine, I can say that to them. It's always fun going to hang out with children's ministry. I've been doing that a lot of Sundays lately, and uh, it's fun going out with Mike and John. It's like being ringside at a, a tag team wrestling match and they're, you know, teaching the Bible and then, hey, what do you think about that, Mike? Boom. And they jump in and the next guy takes over for a little while. It's fun, actually, all of the different people. I, didn't, I wasn't planning to talk about this, but all the people that, that do children's ministry, I just love being a part of it. I, I steal Linda's studies a lot of times. She gives me material that I teach to other people. <laughs> I never told you that. Thanks. And Kent has them doing like Bible memorization and stuff like that. It's it's cool to see all the different uh, things that that the kids are learning with their different teachers. It's fun, and I just get to kind of hang out and be the uh, the enforcer when somebody's wandering and not paying attention. Sit down, stop doing that. It's usually again one of mine, so that works out. Anyway, sorry for the ramble. Uh, a lot of times when I get to do, I call this big church because, you know, kids ministry is little church. This is big church. And a lot of times when I've been doing big church lately, uh, we've been in the book of Acts because that makes it easier for me to just keep going. I'm doing Acts in the midweek and I just keep going mid uh, Acts during big church, right? But like I said, I've only got one study left in Acts, and I, I really wanted to save it for Wednesday night. I don't know, it just felt right to me. So today we're going to be in Philippians, and Philippians is actually what we started in the youth group now that we have enough kids to be doing youth group again. Um, we began to look at the book of Philippians, and um, you know, I already kind of covered a, an introduction to Philippians with the youth group. So we're going to be a little bit into chapter one and we're going to, where we start is really the foundation, the, the central key part of the whole rest of the book of Philippians. So it's a good spot for us to be in this morning. If you read the book of Philippians, there's a lot of things that are going on in that book, Paul was writing to that church in Philippi to tell them about 
his time in prison, that he was doing okay. He was telling them, hey, look, this, this sick friend or this friend that you, that you sent to me and you heard that he was sick, I want to reassure you that he's actually getting better and he's, he's doing okay. So um, that kind of stuff. There was also a gift that the Philippians sent to Paul. Um, he was living on his own dime while he was in jail. And so they sent him money to support him while he was in jail. And so he was thanking them for that. He was also kind of mediating in some squabbles that they had in the church. It's always nice to find in the New Testament that the church wasn't even perfect back then. They had church drama. Um, and so there's a lot of stuff going on in, in uh, not Acts, sorry, Philippians. There's a lot of stuff going on in Acts too. Uh, but the real core of Philippians is what we're going to study this morning. And I think of it as like the hub, the things that Paul was really talking about when he was addressing the church's drama or he was thanking them for the things that they'd done for him. Um, he is communicating to the church all during that time. The hub is, is Paul's philosophy about Christian living. Like, what are we supposed to be doing as Christians? And if, to me, the most important message any of us could ever hear is the gospel, right? We are sinners. God loves us anyway. He sent his son to die for us so that we could be reconciled with him. That's the most important message that we can hear. But the one that we're going to talk about this morning, about what are we supposed to do next, how are we supposed to live as Christians, that's pretty high up there. I think that might be the second most important message that we can hear. What are we supposed to do now that we are reconciled? How are we supposed to live the rest of our lives here on earth? You know, are we supposed to just continue the way that we're, we're, we were before? Or are we supposed to be somehow different than we were before. So all the things that Paul talks about are pointing back to that, that central hub of how are we supposed to live as Christians. And so we're going to be in uh, Philippians chapter 1, and, and the start of our text is really verse 12, but I'm going to skip down to verse 21 to begin with. And it's a verse that I'm sure that you are very well familiar with, um, but it's really the key of everything else that we're going to talk about. So we're going to start with that one, and then we're going to move around in the verses surrounding that after that. All right, so Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, Paul says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now, I kind of like to think about things out of context, right? I just like to, to think about what would this be like if you had never heard it before? And I know that, that for us, we have some context for this, right? We've been talking about this as a body of believers for about 2,000 years now. It's, we all have some sort of foundation. We understand kind of the things that Paul was talking about. But what would it be like for the Philippians to be the first people to read this? It must have been weird for them. You know, how can it be, like, is Paul turning Christ into a verb here? To live is Christ, uh, how can somebody do that? Or how could somebody possibly gain by dying? What, what is Paul describing? And Paul is really describing how he himself lives. He doesn't live for himself anymore. He used to. And if you read the book of, of Philippians further on in chapter 3, he gives a long list of all the things that he used to think were so great about himself, the things that he really prided himself in. But after he met Jesus, he changed his mind about what was important in his life. This is Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 7. Paul says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. So instead of living to gain in those ways that he used to, Paul left that all behind. He, he considers it rubbish. It's the word rubbish there it means a dung heap. And some people actually say that this was the Greek equivalent of a curse word that Paul uses in the New Testament. Um, and so that's how highly he considers his old life anymore. It's just a pile of poop. And... 
he doesn't live for that anymore. But what, what Paul does, he lives for Jesus. He, he lives the way that Jesus would have lived if he was still here. And so that's what Paul means when he says, for me to live is Christ. I'm done with that stuff. And now I'm, I'm giving my entire life to live the way that Jesus lived, to live for Jesus. And because he lived that way, he was able to make that statement of, for me to live as Christ and to die is to gain. And so when his life here on earth was over, he looked forward to getting to go with Jesus. This is uh, another place where Paul writes, is 2 Corinthians. And I, I tried to pick example verses from other, pl- other letters of Paul because this isn't the only place that he talked about this. So this is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. He said, so we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So that's Paul's idea of what our lives of, as Christians should look like. Now that we have been reconciled to Christ, now that we know him, we need to be living for him, and not just for ourselves, not for the things that we can gain here in the here and now, but for Jesus. And a lot of times, ideas can look really good on paper until you try to put them into action. And I think uh, most of the people that I know that try to give life advice to me or I have see them give it to other people, most of those people are hypocrites, right? Because they give you advice, they tell you how you should do things, but they're not willing to actually do those things yourself. I, I know a, a few people who have gone into like the life coach sort of career path, and I think, man, I, I don't know that I would want to take advice from that person, knowing them. Like, I don't, I don't think that's a great. Uh, maybe I should stop talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not taking that advice. Um, but that's not Paul, right? Paul wasn't just spewing out things that he thought other people should do. He didn't just talk the talk, but he walked the walk. And so that's sort of the, the core of the things that we're going to be talking about this morning. For me to live as Christ, to die as gain. And now we're going to walk around in Philippians a little bit and see how Paul actually lived those things out. How did it, when the, the rubber met the road, what did that actually look like for Paul? So rewind a little bit. Now back to verse 12 of Philippians chapter 1. Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And just so we all know, what happened to Paul was that he was unjustly accused, falsely accused of a crime. He was arrested, and he has spent years now in jail waiting for a a fair trial. Um, We've been talking about this in Acts for, it feels like, months now. Paul was... um, in the temple in Jerusalem, and the Jews accused him of desecrating the temple. When he hadn't, they just decided that he must have since he was there. Um, and they dragged him out of the temple and were in the process of beating him to death. They, that was like the goal. They were punching him and kicking him on the ground with the intent of killing him that way. When the Roman soldiers saw this ruckus going on, and they came and just, as a matter of course, if this guy's getting beat to death on the streets, he probably has done something wrong, and they took him and arrested him. Um, And since that time, Paul has had sham trial after sham trial. He's had all these hearings. And most of the time, the Roman officials look at each other and say, hey, I I don't think this guy's actually done anything. He doesn't seem like he's actually done anything wrong. And yet they continue to keep him in jail. They are supposed to be the people who are in charge of justice, who are supposed to be finding the truth. And instead of that, they're using Paul as a sort of political bargaining chip. They know that if they give Paul to the Jews, the Jews are going to be a little bit more uh, compliant with Roman rule for a little while. So they're kind of trying to use Paul as this bargaining chip. And after enough time passes, Paul sees that he's getting railroaded, and he, of course, appeals to Caesar. And so since that point where he appealed to Caesar... He has continued to suffer. He has continued to be mistreated. He's been through shipwrecks. He's had to be transported to Rome where he's going to get his appeal. And so by the time that Paul writes this book of Philippians, he's in Rome. He's been in jail for 
many years now, and he has yet to have an actual trial that determines his guilt or innocence. And so that's what Paul was talking about when he says to them, what happened to me has actually advanced the gospel. Just so that's all clear. But it's, he's not like talking about like, hey, I, I had a flat tire and it turned out to not kind of be okay. It was a big deal. It wasn't a minor inconvenience. So here we go again, verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is, in, is for Christ. So Paul has been in prison for all these years, but he's saying it, it hasn't really been that big of a deal for me. It's been okay because the important thing to me is that the gospel has continued to advance. In Acts, we've seen how Paul got pulled out of jail and he got to talk to the governor Felix many times. Every, you know, he was in jail for two years with Felix and Felix would frequently call him out and, and talk to him. He got to give his testimony to the next governor who was named Festus. He got to give his testimony before King Agrippa. And then after he appealed to Caesar, he of course is expecting he's gonna get to go and um, give his testimony before Caesar, the ruler of the world, right? Um, but he's had this whole time where he's chained to his guards and he's in the process of traveling. He gets to share the gospel with all the, the centurion and the soldiers and a whole ship full of other, other passengers. And so these are all people who would never have encountered the gospel before if it hadn't been for Paul getting in this, this trouble, unjustly accused, falsely arrested, kept without any kind of trial. Um, and then that continued when Paul was in Rome. You know, we don't have the, the record of what it was like for Paul in Acts. But he says that the whole imperial guard was now very well aware that Paul was imprisoned for Christ. And that's because they're forced to be with Paul. They have this, you know, no choice. They have to go and be in close proximity with Paul. And Paul's going to just spray him with the gospel every time that they get close. And so, again, the only way that those men would have ever heard the gospel is because Paul was unjustly accused and he got sent to jail. And so Paul tells him, I want you to know that what happened to me has advanced the gospels, the gospel. God was opening doors for Paul that Paul didn't even know were there before. And um, he was excited about that. That was worth the cost for him. He was, he was okay with that. But it wasn't only Paul who was advancing the gospel. Many others were inspired to preach because of the things that were happening to Paul also. Verse 14 and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice, Yes, and I will rejoice. So there was a multiplying effect to this advance of the gospel. It wasn't just Paul who was preaching to people who wouldn't hear it otherwise, but many other believers, he said, many of the brothers have been spreading the gospel because of they see what happened to me. And Paul said there was two different ways that this was happening. Some people were um, preaching from goodwill, right? They saw that Paul was suffering for the gospel and that he was doing it without fear and without any kind of regret. And so they thought, hey, you know what? Maybe I should get up and I should do that too. Um, it, and, you know, of course they knew that there was a possible cost to this. If Paul could be arrested, then anybody can be arrested, right? But they were preaching without fear. And, and Paul says it's a direct result of what had happened to him. If Paul hadn't been arrested and spent years in jail and all the rest of the horrible things that ended up happening with him, then those other Christians would have remained silent. They would have just continued to be seats in a pew or whatever, the audience. And I, I know, and I've experienced this myself, a lot of times Christians think that the work of the church should be left to the professionals, right? And I, I get that. Imagine if you were a believer like in Galatia, 
and Paul the apostle is in town and somebody says, hey, why don't you share the gospel with these people? No, why would I? Paul is right here. Why are you asking me to share the gospel when you can have it from Paul? That I'm not going to get up and preach. Paul is here. Don't be ridiculous. But now all of a sudden, Paul is in jail. He can't be preaching in the synagogues. He can't be preaching in the marketplaces or even from his own pulpit. And so all of those believers suddenly begin to realize, wait, if, if we want the gospel to go out, it's going to have to be through you and me. We're going to get up and do it. And maybe it's not so bad if we have to suffer for that because Paul is going through it and he seems to be having a great time. You know, And so these people were um, encouraged. They, they gained confidence because Paul was no longer there, and they realized it was going to be them instead. But there were others who saw Paul's absence as an opportunity for advancement. He said they were preaching out of envy and out of rivalry, and they were even um, preaching in a way that they thought was going to make Paul jealous. And so they saw that, hey, Paul isn't in the marketplace anymore. Paul's not able to be in the pulpit. And so instead of people sitting and being impressed when Paul shares the gospel, they're going to be impressed when I share the gospel. They're going to look to me as like the next Paul and I'm going to take his place. And man, Paul's going to just be burning with jealousy in jail. And Paul was not burning with jealousy in jail. Paul, um, he was very much like John the Baptist. When John the Baptist was going around preaching, his whole goal, right, was to point people to Jesus. And so when Jesus arrived and he recognized that and he started to tell his disciples, hey, go listen to that guy instead. And some of his, his disciples came to him, or it didn't say it was disciples. Some people came to John the Baptist and said, hey, you remember that guy that you baptized in the Jordan? He's over there and he's baptizing people now and he's got a much bigger crowd. And John said, hey, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. And in John 3 verse 30 John the Baptist said, he must increase, but I must decrease. That was John the Baptist's mindset about Jesus and service and everything else. And so that's how Paul thought as well. He was not at all worried if there was other preachers filling his pulpit. He wasn't at all worried if somebody else was doing a better job than he had done before. Um, for him to live was Christ. And he was living that out in real life. He wasn't just saying that, he was actually doing it. And so people were actively, maliciously trying to, to make him jealous, to harm him while he was in jail. And Paul's response to that was joy. He was just happy that Jesus' name was going out. And that was what really actually mattered to him. And, you know, the gospel was advancing. He got to, to meet and preach to a lot of people that he would never have had an opportunity to talk to any other way. And all of these other people were preaching the gospel to folks that Paul would never meet on his own. They were reaching people that, that Paul couldn't get to, right? And that, that's how I think about the people in here. Like I hear all the time about the, the people in your lives that you are reaching out to with the gospel, your neighbors, your friends, the people that you meet out and about doing things. They're people that I would never have an in with. They're people that I would never have a, a trusting relationship, right? Because I didn't live next to them for 20 years and help them when the tree fell down and everything else. And those are, those are ways that the gospel, gospel advances that have nothing to do with my personal involvement or Jeff's personal involvement. And that's the way the gospel is supposed to work. So, Paul is rejoicing, and it's amazing that he could rejo rejo rejoice in these circumstances. It happens. In jail. And he could never do that if he was living for himself, right? Rewind that a little bit. There's no way if Paul was worried about Paul's life that he would have any sort of joy from the things that have been going on in his life. But he does that because... He lived for Jesus. And that mindset continues as we continue to read on. Verse 19 through 20. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of, Christ, of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, 
but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. So this, I think, is one of the most incredible passages. Like these two verses in the Bible are just mind-blowing to me. Paul is talking to this group of believers, and he's telling them, hey, I know that you guys are praying for me, and I appreciate it, and I know that God is going to answer your prayers and grant me deliverance. And that word deliverance there in the Greek is soteria, and it means salvation and or deliverance. And then there's a few times that it's, it's translated as to have strength or to be strong enough to accomplish something that's difficult. And that meshes in perfectly with, with what Paul is actually talking about here because he said that his hope is not, you know, released from jail. His hope is that whether he lives or dies, that he will be able to honor Christ with his body. And you think about the guys that are, that are on death row all over America, and, and they're constantly filing for appeals, or they're hoping for the call from the government, they're, or the governor. You know, they're not hoping that their execution goes off really cool. They're hoping and praying that they get let out of jail. Like that's their hope of deliverance. But that's not what Paul is talking about. For Paul, deliverance means the strength that it's going to take to die well for Jesus. That's what he's hoping for. And he says, that's, I know that when you're praying for me and you're praying for my deliverance, God is going to grant me the strength to die well for him. And that's because that's what he, he lived for. That was his whole point of existence for him. He was doing that with his life, and he, he had his great hope to continue to do that in his death. And if he died well, he would call that deliverance. And that's why I think that th- this whole passage is just so mind-blowing to me, is because that was the way that he thought, and I, I don't know that I can wrap my mind around that yet. But that's how he thought about life. Verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue for you all, for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may, able, you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. So that's where Paul speaks that line that we begin with. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He was talking about the things that had happened to him already and the things that he was looking forward to happening, he, the things that he expected to continue to happen in his life. And of course, he knows that there are two possible outcomes to the trial that he's going to face. And he describes them. What does it look like? I'm either going to be released from jail or I'm going to die here. Um, and if he dies, he says, I'm going to be with Christ, and that's far better. He says, um, he uses the word depart there, and to depart is the Greek word anayo, and that means to strike camp and move on, which goes on per- like perfectly with the things that, we've had a lot of funerals around here. I mean, I guess not all of them have been here. I went to three funerals in a week not too long ago when uh, we had, had Tony Barrios' funeral, and Jeff was talking about the, the tent that we all live in and how the body is, is the tent. And Paul's looking forward to just, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm kind of done with this tent. I'm, I can put it away now and move on. And he says that would be far better. That's not just something that Paul is okay with happening. That's his first choice. This is my preference of the matter is I'm going to move out of here and get to go do something better. And how would that not be anything but gain for Paul? If his whole life is for Jesus to be done with this and the suffering and everything else that comes along with his tent to move out and go to be with Jesus, of course, that would be deliverance. And that's not true for everybody. In fact, I'd say that's not true for, for most people. For most people, death is, is a loss. It's not gain. You spend your whole life trying to just scrabble together your stuff, you know, and you can pile up treasure for yourself. You can spend your time accomplishing things that you can brag about or 
sculpting your appearance to be better than everybody else around you or whatever else. And you lose all that at the end. When you die, that all that, that where does it go? Jesus told a parable about that sort of life. This is Luke chapter 12, uh, starting in verse 16. Jesus said, oh, so it says, and he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will those be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So obviously death is loss for that guy. Death is not gain for that man because he lived for the here and now. To die was gain for Paul because his life was Christ. And I, I'm afraid that sometimes we take that idea to live as Christ, to die as gain, kind of out of the context that Paul used it here. Because we say to live as Christ, but we mean it in a way that's personally beneficial for us. Like we pursue Christ in a way that benefits us, which is, it's kind of a squirrely idea, right? I, to live as Christ, and so I sp- make sure that I spend a lot of time reading the Bible. To live as Christ, so I make sure that I fast once a week. I never fast once a week, guys. I'm not making that claim. To live as Christ, and so I sing as loud as I can in church. And those things are all good things. I'm not bashing on any of that. All of those things honor Jesus. And yet, they all also are personally beneficial to the person who does them, right? I grow and I benefit when I spend time in the word. I grow and I benefit when I fast. I grow and I benefit when I I worship God in church. But when Paul talks about living for Christ, he talks about that being a benefit to to other people. Um, He says that he hopes to be able to come to them for their, their joy, for their progress, that they would continue to grow. And the reason I am sort of emphasizing this is I, I have known way too many people who live their lives as Christians in, in a sort of vacuum. And they spend all their time researching theology and catechisms and orthodoxy and everything else. Uh, I've known many pastors who sort of ivory tower themselves. They go to their office, they close the door, and they spend all their time just in the books and the books and the books so that they can give a good sermon in the next you know, Sunday morning. And hey, I confess, I'm guilty of that sometimes too, because I feel like, hey, I need to make sure I do a good job, right? And so I need to make sure I get this right. But it's a problem when you get all that head knowledge and you don't ever actually do anything with it. You just grow your own personal prideful knowledge base. And our old pastor used to call Christians like that tadpoles, great big head full of knowledge tiny little tail to do anything with it. You can't move it around. But when Paul says to live as Christ, he means he lives in a way that Christ lived. He lives in a way that other people progress, other people have joy, other people grow because of Paul's life for Christ. And again, it's incredible that Paul is saying this from jail. He, he says, if I get out of here, then... I'm, I can't wait to get back to work. I can't wait to come and visit the churches that I've been to before and help them to continue to grow. I hope that, that I get to show up in your town and you guys can have joy because you see me released from jail. He, he's not thinking about his own joy in being released from jail. If I was in jail, I'd be thinking about, I am going to eat so much ice cream when I get out of here. And I'm going to buy a motorcycle and, and just drive around and, and enjoy freedom. Paul isn't at all thinking about those things. He is just thinking about, I can't wait. If I get out of here, I'm going to continue to work and work and serve and do things for other people. He wanted to live that way because that's how Jesus lived. Mark 10, 45, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And so Paul considered that the way to spend his time here on earth is just like Jesus, 
not to serve himself, but to serve other people. And he's, he's writing to them in, in Philippi because he, that, that's what he wants to see them live like. It's not just a brag about like, hey, this is how I live and you guys should be impressed with me. But he's hoping to impart all of that to them as well. He wants them to understand the joy and the freedom that comes with living that way. And he spells it out really clearly when you get to Philippians chapter 2. This is Philippians 2, verses 3 through 8. He says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so that's what it looks like on a practical level, right? You're not just looking out for yourself. You're not just reading to gain knowledge, but you're reading because you hope that you're going to learn something that you can use to help somebody else and to take the comfort that God gives you and comfort somebody else with it. That's what he talks about in Corinthians. That's what it means to live is Christ, to live like Christ, to live for Christ, to live as if Christ was inhabiting your physical body. You know, we used to have those bracelets in the 90s. It was a huge fad. What would Jesus do, WWJD? I mean, it was everywhere when I was in high school. Everybody had those. Nobody actually did it. <laughs> they just liked the merchandise and to fit in with the group. Yeah, it's sad. But, you know, the truth is, it doesn't really matter what we can build up and gain here on the earth. You know, getting back to that, you can spend all your time amassing a fortune. You can spend all your time being impressive to other people or impressing yourself or just learning all there is to know about a certain niche society and history and just becoming prideful about all of that kind of stuff. I, I've known people to do all of those different things, but it doesn't matter. What matters in the perspective of Jesus is how you use your life to help others. That's it. That's what Jesus looks at. This is Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer to him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. And none of those things that Jesus just listed are personally beneficial to the person who did it. Right? They didn't get anything out of giving away their clothes or visiting the people who were sick. Those were things that were done just to benefit somebody who was in need. And I know a lot of that sounds like, hey, that's a, a doctrine of works. Now I've got to do stuff in order to be saved. But no, you know what? Those people didn't become sheep because they did those things. They did those things because they were sheep. They were following their shepherd. This is the way that Jesus lived. You read the Gospels. That's all of his time was spent that way. Not because he wanted us to to earn our way into the kingdom, but we're following him. For me to live is Christ. And that's the way that Jesus lived. That's the way that he wants me to, to live. And it's not because I'm becoming a better person by being, you know, generous. But that's what God made me. When we become his, he, he gives us a new spirit. He gives us a new desire of how we're going to live our life. And my desire is to follow Jesus. 
I want to live the way that he lived. And that doesn't make me change into like, now you're a, a super Tom instead of just a regular, you know, kind of selfish Tom. No, I'm just living for Jesus, for me to live as Christ. And that is not because I'm so great, but because Christ is so great. And again, I, I'm not claiming that this is a thing that I've got nailed down and you guys just do as I do and you'll be fine. No, we, we all need to just continue to encourage each other, continue to, to find ways to build each other up. And that's the way that the gospel is going to go out through us. We look at this life, we count it as loss and expect that means that we're going to gain Jesus. One last verse, and again, it's from a different place in the New Testament. Galatians 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's pray, and then we're going to start uh, communion. Jesus, I'm so thankful for the death that you died on the cross for me. That you saw my sin, you saw the separation that came because of my sin, and you loved me, and you died, and you, you paid the, the price for my sin. And I know that's true for everybody in here. Lord, you love each and every one of us, and you died so that we could have life. And so, Lord, we want to give our lives to you. We want to live for, for Christ. We want you to live through us so that when we see someone in need, when we see some sort of help that we can give, Lord, that it would be you reaching out through us, that it would be you working through our, our hands and feet, that your words would come out of our mouths, that, that our hearts would love with your love to the people around us, Lord. And we ask that through all of that, that many, many more people would come into your kingdom, that we would bring more souls into heaven to be filled with joy and not with sorrow. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So it's communion Sunday, so we're gonna um, ask the men to come forward, please, and, and pass out communion if uh, that's been arranged beforehand, not just every man, <laughs> but those of you that, that uh, are supposed to. And, and we're gonna sing a song together while we pass that out, and then uh, we'll take communion together.
This is the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 23. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake together. Lord, we thank you for this communion, this way that you have made for us to remember your death on the cross for us. Lord, I pray that you would bless those who prepared this, this communion, that their families would be blessed, that their lives would be blessed. Lord, and as we have proclaimed your death to everyone here in this room, to ourselves, Lord, we, we pray that it would be that reminder to ourselves that our lives are hidden in you. 
that you have paid the price for us. And so, Lord, we want to live the rest of our lives for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together for one last song.
was just over there thinking about what a blessing it is to be a part of this church body, you know, just uh, we read through Philippians, we talk about serving others and, and thinking of others more highly than ourselves and the rest, and it's like, you guys just keep going, you know, you're doing a good job, it's nothing that, that like you'd never heard before and not, nothing that I haven't already seen in practice in the people around here, so what a blessing, I'm so thankful, so proud <laughs> of all of you guys. We got to stack chairs. Sorry. <laughs> there will come a day when summer and we don't have to stack chairs anymore for a while at least, right? Thank you guys. God bless you. Have a great week.